John chapter 19, we're going to start um, right there, right before verse 17. So they took Jesus, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There, there they crucified him, and with, two, and with him two others on, on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fill the scripture, which says they divided my garments among them and for my clothing, they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Today, today you could go to Jerusalem, and you could, you could walk what they call the Via Della Rosa, the road of suffering, the place from where Jesus was, was, was beaten and the place where they put the cross on him right there in verse 17, bearing his own cross, carrying it, the Via Della Rosa, the road of suffering to Golgotha, the place of the skull. You could walk that path, and no doubt the emotion is still very real for many people as they walk that path. In fact, the start of the Villa Del Rosa today is a church where if you walk into the church, you can go behind the choir loft and you can go down about four flights of stairs and you can go to a place that's ironed off with fencing where it's said that the, that the soldiers right here would have cast lots for that tunic, which is pretty special. And I wish I, could, I wish I could take you there so that you could get the image in your mind of Jesus carrying his cross, knowing what's coming, knowing what's coming, right? And knowing, knowing that he could put a stop to it, knowing that he had just prayed to Father, take this cup from me. Carrying that cross to a hill called Golgotha, the place of the skull, which today is right next to a bus station. And you can look up, you can see the skull right there in the side of that hill, the place where Jesus was crucified. And I don't know about you, but I picture that being like, I picture that being, you know, out a ways, right? I mean, all the pictures that we see today that have to be accurate, Right? I mean, all, they, they picture the place where Jesus was crucified kind of being separate, a separate place from the city. But that's not how they would have done it in this time. They would have done it very publicly. This crucifixion would have been right in the thick of the culture and of the things that were happening because that was part of crucifixion, that it was, that it was to be an embarrassment. Right? It was to be public so that people knew so that people knew the crime that had been committed and that, that, that justice was being served as punishment. And 
we see there that the soldiers took his garments, they, they cast lots, Jesus hanging on the cross, woman, behold your son, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And then we get to verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. And that's the first place where I want to start. I thirst. Because I think we have, I think we have a misconception of Jesus in, in this, right? We all know the passage from Hebrews, the one that, the one that experienced every kind of temptation, all kinds of temptation, right, remained without sin. How many of you, how many of you in the room, and I really, I want you to raise your hand if you're watching this online, I want you to type me in the chat if this was you, because I have a feeling it may just be a couple of us, okay, but, how, but, but I want to know I'm not alone, okay, how many of you have ever looked at a mom or dad, or looked at a, a, a youth leader or a pastor or, a, you know, a, someone, a mentor, someone that you looked up to and said these words, you just wouldn't understand. Anybody? Okay, amen. I'm not alone. Hallelujah. Whew. Okay. How many parents have ever heard that from their kids? You just wouldn't understand right? Multiple times, right? Many times, right? Now that it's April, Kristen and I are coming to grips with the fact that we're about to have a teenager in a month. It's only just beginning, <laughs> right? But you just wouldn't understand. And as the parent, for those of you that raise your hand on the parent end of things, right? How does that make you feel, right? Oh, your response is, oh yeah, you're probably right. Right, you're probably right, just wouldn't understand, right, just move on with life. No, like there's, a, there's almost a grievance in that, right? Like, no, I, I do understand. It may look different and smell different, like we didn't have the talk tick back then, but, but, we, but we understand, right, because it wasn't that Jesus experienced the same temptation, right? It didn't look the same, it didn't smell the same, it, it wasn't the same amount of money, they didn't even measure money the same way at that point, right? But it was the same range of temptation that we experience and yet remain without sin, right? We even know that further from Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes that there's nothing new under the sun, that nothing means nothing, including temptation, right? Including temptation. And so Jesus saying here, I thirst, it tells us about Jesus's physical humanity, his physical humanity, that Jesus was human. He thirsts. Hanging on that cross, I don't know about you, but as I sit there and think, man, like, I, I could think of a lot of things that could be said, but him saying, I thirst, it reminds us of his physical nature, his humanity. See, Jesus was part God, part human. He was fully human. He was fully divine. And why is that important to us? Because of that Hebrews 4.15. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. Jesus entered our suffering. He entered our suffering. When we're weeping for a loved one, Jesus has been there. When we're battling illness, Jesus has been there. When we're the victim of something, uh, Jesus has been there. It is finished. Jesus finished the assignment. He finished his race. He didn't give up. It reminds us of his humanity. And secondly... When we look here, after he says, I thirst, it says there, you know, a jar, a jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it's finished. It's finished. 
that's an interesting place to me. I don't know about you, but it's an interesting place to me for, 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 him, to, for him to hit the credits, right? For him to say it's finished. Because the sour wine on a hyssop branch with a sponge, like that doesn't make sense. And I wish I could go through, I wish I could take the time, but it would take a lot of time to go through the significance of the hyssop branch, to go through the significance of the sponge and the fact that it was sour wine. But Jesus saying on the cross, it is finished, reminds us of Jesus' awareness of Scripture. His awareness of the task at hand. I thirst reminds us of Jesus' extensive knowledge of the prophetic scriptures concerning his suffering and his death. Isaiah 53, he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors, transgressors so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Jesus said, I am thirsty. So in Jesus' words here, I thirst, he's not only showing his humanity, but he's showing his fulfillment of the prophecy. I thirst. I thirst. I thirst. And because he said, I thirst, and they gave him a sponge full of wine, which was just, 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 so, we're, just so we're clear, that, that, was not, that was not a nice thing. That was a mocking. The hyssop branch with the sponge and the sour wine and putting it up to Jesus' mouth. That was just like pouring salt into the wound. But it had to happen for the scripture to be fulfilled. And so we see that Jesus, we see Jesus in his humanity, we see his awareness of the scriptures, and then lastly, I want, to sh- I want to show you this. Jesus' determination to complete his task. His determination to complete his task. See, Jesus, Jesus knew the timing of everything. Stacy mentioned this past Sunday about the first miracle that Jesus performed, right? Turning the water into wine. What was his response when Mary came over and said, hey, guess what? We're at a wedding. They've run out of wine. His response was, it's not, it's not my time. It's not my time. See, one of the things that, 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 we, that we notice about Jesus here is that he's fully aware. He's fully aware, right? He's fully aware of what, what's coming, the task at hand. When he prays in John 17, just a few chapters before, he prays to his Father, I've completed the task that you gave me to do on earth. Let's start the finish, right? Let's begin this. Let's begin this. And then in his humanity, we see him praying in the garden, like we mentioned a few minutes ago, take this cup from me. And we see him in his humanity say, I thirst. We see his awareness of everything, but we see his determination to complete the task because at any point, he could have stepped off of that cross. Right? To strengthen himself, to complete the task. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. For Jesus did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And that's huge for us. Because I want us to, I want us to kind of, uh, you, you don't have to look at me tonight, it's okay. I just want you to kind of gaze on the cross. And I don't know if we can turn that iPhone to kind of, for the folks online to be able to just kind of gaze at the cross. Because as we, as we gaze on the cross, what we need to recognize is, is that's where Jesus hung because of his love for you. This, this, the, this piece of wood, these pieces of wood are what represent what separates Christianity from every other religion. That a Savior died for you because He loved you so much and because you have a debt that you can't pay on your own. And yes, spoiler alert, that there's hope coming. I love the YouTube thing, and I don't know where it originated, but it's an old-time preacher that says, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Amen? We know, like I said, spoiler alert, right? 
It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. And Jesus' determination to complete the work that Father God had given him to do included a cross. It included pain. It included mocking. It included suffering. It included a miracle on the cross that we're going to talk about on Sunday. For you. The Bible says that he came to seek and save those who were lost. And that was part of the plan. In Jesus saying, I thirst, he reveals his humanity. That he's fully God, fully human. It reveals that he is aware of the scriptures and the story and the prophecies that are to be fulfilled. And it reveals his determination to complete the task. It reveals his determination to complete the task. For the message, of, and I love what Paul says to the church at Corinth. To preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Right? I mean, there's no way. There's no way to soften the weight of the crucifixion. There's no way to make this cool. There's no way to make this like tempting for anyone. This is suffering to the nth degree. Like Good Friday is a heavy, weighty day for those of us that get it to think about the links that a Savior went through for me. Talk about grace. Undeserved favor. That's the scandalous part of grace. And I love how Paul says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Right? To those that don't get it, they look at the cross and like, are you kidding me? How does that make sense? Right? I mean, how does that make sense? But there was a debt, that, and, and, that's the, and that's the foolishness. For those that are perishing, they don't understand the weight of their sin. They don't understand the, the, the debt that they have to pay. But to those of us who are being saved, it's the power of God. See, the cross looked like defeat, but it was the finish line. Jesus knew that this was to fulfill the scripture. Jesus knew that this was to finish the work that God had given him to do. Because even in this, right, we say it all the time, because we're about discipleship around here, that the work that Jesus had completed was making disciples. Even in this, he's making disciples. Why? Because to complete the work that he had given him to do, he promised in John 14, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Right? So in order to go and prepare a place for you, he's got to leave a place to go and prepare a place. Right? This was him leaving a place. Y'all see that? I know, I just said y'all. You guys see that? That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Hebrews 12, 1 and 3. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, he's talking about I say he, we don't know who the writer of Hebrews is. The writer of Hebrews is talking about Hebrews 11, the hall of faith and all these stories. By faith, this happened. By faith, this happened. By faith, all of these things happened. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such great a cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Consider him 
who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Chances are you've heard me say this before, but our dear friend Russ Willett says from verse 2, the fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. Do you know what the joy that was set before Jesus was when he endured the cross? It was you. You were the joy. You were the one. We were the people. Those that were going to be with him in the kingdom of heaven that we're going to talk about on Sunday. Like, like you were on his mind there. You were what gave him the strength to complete the task that Father God had given him to do. It was because of the determination that you gave him that he could hang there. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. It was you. It was you. See, we can finish the race because Jesus finished the race. We can endure. We can persevere. We can overcome. The innocent one has assumed the charges of the guilty one so that the guilty can become innocent. He himself took on him the burden of our sin. He gave his own son as a ransom for us, the holy one for transgressors, the blameless one for the wicked, the righteous one for the unrighteous, the, inc the incorruptible one for the corruptible, the immortal one for, the, for them that are mortal. For what other thing was capable of covering our sins than his righteousness? By what other thing? One, was it possible that we, the wicked and ungodly, could be justified that, than by the only Son of God? So I have, a, I have a couple questions for you that I want us to think about. Number one is this. When you think about your life, because today is all about a burial. It's all about a sacrifice. It's all about Jesus on the cross going into the grave. And there's two, thi there's, two, there's two things that I want us to think about here. Number one, in our lives, thinking about your life, what's buried that needs to stay buried? Like, what's that thing that keeps coming up? And you're like, oh man, I could revisit that thing. Or I could, I could go back into, or I could do that again. Right? I could go back into that way of living. There are some things that need to stay buried in our lives. Amen? I mean, there's some things, right? We've all got those things. Don't be, don't be holier than thou and super righteous in the house of God. You're lying in church if you say you don't have those things, right? There's some things in our life that are buried that need to stay buried, amen? But what are those things in our life that are buried that need to be resurrected? Because what convicts me every good Friday about the goodness of Friday is that he didn't do that for nothing. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame so that you could be set free. It's for freedom that he set us free. And yet I look around and, 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 and Good Friday is a celebration for those that have been set free. Amen? That's a celebration for those of us that have been set free. Why are so many of us still in bondage? Why are so many of us continuing to bury the freedom that Jesus died for? The worship team is going to come. How's that? This pastor's trying to learn how to preach shorter. <laughs> I 
I want to read something over you. Don't leave buried what Jesus died to bring to life. But I'm going to read to you Psalm chapter 22. Psalm 22 goes along with Good Friday. Psalm 23 goes along with Saturday. We know Psalm 23, right? Read Psalm 23 tomorrow morning as you wake up. Psalm 24 goes along with Sunday. Don't read ahead. Don't be that person. Okay? Psalm 23 tomorrow, Psalm 24 Sunday. But I just want to read this over you. Psalm 22. It's a little long. Bree, if you want to start playing or something, <laughs> might be good. Psalm 22. Before Jesus came on the map, before Jesus humbled himself and stepped out of heaven, Philippians 2, we get this in Psalm 22 from David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel, and you, our fathers, trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him, let, let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from my birth and from my mother's womb. You have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. 22.11, be not far from me, for trouble is near and there is none to help me. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I'm poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They've pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far off. O oh, you help. You, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who feared the Lord, praised him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you offspring of Israel, for he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. And he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. I know this is long, it's almost done. Don't miss the end here. From you comes my praise in the great congregation, my vows. I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the Nehes God and all the nations and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. 
It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn. That he has done it. That he has done it. That he has done it. Listen to me, sinner. He's bought you. He's bought you on purpose for a purpose. Don't bury that purpose. Don't bury that purpose. Don't bury that purpose. Sure, there's some things that are buried that need to stay buried, but there's some things that are buried that need to come back to life. We're going to sing a song. And like we do every Good Friday, after this song, we're going to take communion together. So I encourage you. I mean, look, if you want to stand, I'm not going to tell you to sit down. But whatever posture you need to take right now in gratitude of our Lord and Savior, I challenge you and encourage you to reflect on the cross. The humanity of Jesus. His knowledge of the scriptures to be fulfilled. And his determination to finish the work he started for the joy that was set before. God, Thank you. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me in my hopelessness, in my filthy rags. God, if you can save me, you can save any person in this room. I thank you for that. God, I pray that we don't bury what's supposed to be alive. God, that we don't bear opportunities. We don't bury opportunities to share you with other people for fear that we're not well spoken for fear that we don't have a slip of paper or an education but God you have done a work in each and every heart in this room you have sent your son for each and every person in this room we are all the joy that was set before you and God I pray that you bring back to life some things tonight I pray that you bring back to life some things that are dead this weekend within us. And God, I pray over this weekend for your church. The enemy has no foothold. You've won the victory. You've won the victory.